angina or angina depending on how you pronounce it is the topic for this video and angina um, is uh, basically chest pain the cause is the heart muscle which is uh, known as the myocardium um, basically is not getting enough oxygen the heart muscle receives oxygen uh, through arteries known as the coronary arteries and these coronary arteries are probably some of the most important arteries in the body if not the most important and what happens over time is uh, if this is a coronary artery over time you develop these plaques um, color them in yellow here to kind of illustrate a concept known as atherosclerosis atherosclerosis is basically the process by which these coronary arteries become narrowed so the more narrow these coronary arteries become uh, the less oxygen can reach the heart muscle and when the heart muscle doesn't get the adequate oxygen the patient develops angina and uh, the narrowing of these coronary arteries is not the only reason this can happen it can also happen because of a coronary artery spasm or it can also happen because of a blood clot and the technical term for a blood clot is a thrombus and if a blood clot moves, it's then known as an embolus. So these are other reasons why you can get um, um, blockage of these uh, coronary arteries. And that's very important to remember. Uh, it's a fundamental aspect of um, heart disease. So what are the symptoms? What they actually describe more commonly is a pressure chest pressure a crushing sensation um, also uh, radiation to the left arm is also described uh, radiation to the back as well now there's two terms that I really need to understand when it comes to angina they're stable angina and there's unstable angina and this is very important the easiest or simplest way to to describe the difference is that you can think of unstable angina as chest pain or angina that occurs at rest while stable angina is occurring with exertion naturally this one is of course the more serious one so let's say you have a patient and you're pretty sure that they've got cardiac related chest pain also known as angina how would you go about diagnosing this the very first test you would do is an EKG also sometimes written as an ECG electrocardiogram the two things that you look for there's a lot of things of course but there's ST segment depression I mean, ST segment is this segment right here and that will be depressed, it will be lower, it will probably be down here and that is related to ischemia and then that's by far the most typical EKG finding when you have uh, ischemia of the heart muscle the next uh, test you would do is actually a very important test it's called stress testing uh, simple way to describe it it's an EKG that you do while the person is exercising on a treadmill so the person's walking on a treadmill and you're doing an EKG so it's the same test but this time the person is exercising and that will give you uh, some more information about the patient's uh, level of ischemia and it's a very specific test it's a very sensitive test and very important now what if the per person can exercise what, what if the person is unable to get on a treadmill and walk or run you know elderly patient or, or the patient just simply isn't able to do it well you can still do a stress test but it's known as a 
pharmacologic stress test. And what that essentially means is that the person will have a drug given to them that will stress the heart. Uh, instead of the treadmill, instead of the exercise being done on the treadmill stressing the heart, they're just given a medication. And there's two medications that are the most commonly given. There's dobutamine, and there's another medication called persantine. And these are the two most common medications that are given uh, to stress the heart for people who are unable to walk or run on a treadmill. Once that is done, and you are convinced that this person does indeed have blockage of the coronary arteries that's leading to ischemia, which is causing the heart muscle to have an inadequate supply of oxygen, then you would do a test called an angiography. And an angiography is basically a test that you do to diagnose the level of um, coronary artery disease. And this will tell you in a percentage how much of the lumen of this coronary artery is blocked. So an angiography is a very very important test. So as you can see the lumen is now reduced in size quite a bit because of all these plaques and let's say it's 70 percent narrowed. The beauty of this test is while you're doing it you can treat it's a diagnostic and therapeutic as they say you can treat this by placing a stent and a stent is a small uh, device that you can place um, it kinda looks like it's like a little device that you place it inside and then once you place it inside you open it and what it does when you open it is it allows uh, the lumen to become a little um, larger than its current blockage. It's used to diagnose coronary artery disease, it's used to figure out what, uh, how much of blockage there is in the coronary artery and you can place a stent and just great uh, test to diagnose and to uh, treat coronary artery atherosclerosis. So now let's get into the treatment. We talked a little bit about the treatment, but let's get into the medical parts of it. Well, before you jump into any of the medications, you want to basically do lifestyle modifications. So smoking needs to be addressed, you know, blood pressure, salt, cholesterol, that kind of thing. The next thing are the drugs. And the drugs are very important. And there's about, uh, there's about three or four. The first are what you call antiplatelet drugs, and those include aspirin and Plavix. Uh, Plavix is also known as clopidogrel. And what these drugs do is they decrease platelet aggregation, so they prevent blood clots from forming. They prevent thrombus and emboli, so they prevent platelet aggregation. Uh, the next type of drug is something called a beta blocker. And a beta blocker is important because what it can do is it can reduce heart rate, it can also reduce blood pressure, and by doing that you can reduce the, the uh, myocardial uh, oxygen uh, demand. And that can of course decrease the uh, ischemia. The next drug, very important also, is nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin is a direct vasodilator. So what it does is it opens up. So if you have a coronary artery like that, it can vasodilate and make it bigger. So you have more uh, of a of a lumen, uh, more space for the blood to flow through and supply oxygen to the heart muscle. And then there's other medications as well, um, but those are by far the most important. 
And then the two surgical treatments are, we just talked about the stent placement. And then there's one called CABG, cabbage, which is coronary artery bypass graft. And what that means is sometimes you have so much, actually let me use yellow, sometimes you have so much of a atherosclerosis that you can't even place the stent. So what they do is something called a bypass graft, which is they bypass the that um, area. So now the blood can go through this bypass gr graft that you placed. Um, it's a very, very obviously a elaborate surgery, but very important. So now let's get into some clinical vignettes and uh, see what this is all about in a patient presentation. Okay, so a 68-year-old male is brought to the emergency department because of substernal chest pain. On interview, a patient reports having have a past uh, myocardial infarction five years ago. He has typical anginal pain when climbing stairs, so that's exertion and lifting heavy objects that is relieved by taking nitroglycerin tablets and resting. In the last week, however, his angel symptoms have become more frequent and occur when walking even short distances. In the hospital, the patient continues to have chest pain over the left side, accompanied by shooting pain in his left arm. Blood pressure is 160 over 90, pulse is 109, oxygen saturation is 96. Physical exam is unremarkable, chest x-ray is clear, uh, electrocardiogram shows Q waves and leads 2, 3 in AVF. T wave inversions and leads one, a V1 through V3. Lab studies show potassium at 3.2. Hematocrit 42 and initial cardiac markers are negative. Patient receives oxygen, aspirin, beta blocker, IV heparin, and placed on a platelet uh, inhibitor. In addition, he is made pain-free on IV nitroglycerin. A repeat EKG without pain is unchanged, and the most appropriate next step is... Well, this patient is obviously having a, well, a case of unstable angina because his anginal symptoms actually uh, are getting worse. Initially, they were occurring with uh, exertion, but now they're occurring even when... He, He's not even doing much, as it says, more frequent, even when walking short distances. So he's actually now getting to the point where he's complaining of chest pain at rest. Now, one thing that is important is that he obviously needs to have some sort of intervention. It's inappropriate to just uh, observe him. Uh, you can't just observe somebody who's got all these problems so A's out. A is out. Um, C might be something that you need to do but you need to before you do a cabbage you have to do another test before that so that's not the next step. Uh, this balloon pump is something that you would probably do um, if there's valvular disease but he doesn't have any valvular disease as far as you know at least not yet and then the TPA he doesn't meet the criteria for that. Uh, that's something that uh, you would do if um, there would be different EKG findings. So for a process of elimination, it's B, and B is the correct answer because remember, he's already had the EKGs, and after the EKG, uh, you would actually want to do this angiography to determine uh, the level of uh, blockage in his, cor in his coronary arteries. And at the same time, you can also do a stent placement. And then last question, 69-year-old Chinese-Canadian man with diabetes had an MI two years ago. He had exertional and angina since then and has been taking propranolol. During the past few days, he has one episode of chest pain at rest, two episodes postprandially, and one that night. EKG shows old MI. Most appropriate treatment is. Well, this is another case of unstable angina because he's having chest pain at rest. And... Uh, having let's choice E having him rest and you know and sedation at night that that's not an appropriate choice he, he needs to be evaluated uh, D these two are talking about his propranolol dose sort of just 
saying, okay, well, let's increase it or decrease it and see you later. Well, that's inappropriate because he needs to be managed inpatient. So now we're down to A and B. Um, B is not the best management at this time. He requires further evaluation first. Uh, before you can rush him to the OR and do this test, you have to first do some other testing like an angiography. So A is the perfect one. Admit him and then do some cardiac monitoring and adjust his therapy.